The algorithm you're watching is called insertion sort. It's slow, and so simple it's almost dumb, but it's something you use all the time, even if you don't know it. In this video, we'll learn insertion sort by starting with intuition and asking key questions that'll help you understand this or any algorithm. And I'll also tell you why, despite being slow, insertion sort is everywhere. Let's start by thinking intuitively about just one step. Which items are out of place here? Right, it's just these. Now if these bars were lying on a table in front of you, how would you get this one to be where it should be? You might set it aside, bump these down to make space, and insert it into the right spot. And that's the basic idea of what we do on one step in insertion sort. Now let's ask and answer two key questions that are useful for thinking about algorithms. Question 1. What exactly do we do on each step? Question 2. Where do we start and finish? So on each step, I want to put one item into the right order. Now we can see that this item is out of place. But our algorithm can't see, so we can't jump straight to that item. Let's go forward from where we were by one space. We'll call this the current item. I want to put the current item in order. If it's already in order, I don't have to do anything. So let's first ask, is current in order? Yes, but what exactly does it mean to be in order? If we're sorting from smallest to largest, it means the current item is greater than or equal to the previous. You could also say it's smaller than the next item, but let's not worry about the next item for now. It'll get its turn soon. So we've figured out how to know if current is in order. It is, so we finished one step. Move on. Here, is current greater than or equal to previous? Yes, so move on again. Now the current is not in order. How do we get it in order? If it's out of order because current is smaller than previous, we can put it in order by swapping those two. But the item we were looking at still isn't in order. And we want one step of our algorithm to put one item in order. So let's just keep swapping while this item is smaller than the one before it. And there it is. Now to remind you, this is where we took that item from. What do you notice about the array before and including that point? It's all sorted. Insertion sort really works by building a sorted array one step at a time as it moves down. Keep that in mind. So on one step of our algorithm, if current is greater than or equal to previous, we do nothing. And if it's not, that is, if it's less than previous, we swap down while it's less than the previous. Notice that if we move an item down while it's out of place, we won't move it if it's already in place, which is what we want, so we can simplify this. We've answered one key question, what to do for each item. So where exactly do we start and finish? This is a great question to ask about any algorithm. Let's consider a more random array. So the obvious answer is to start at the first element, but that's wrong. We need to compare each item with the previous, but there's nothing before the first item. So we can start with the second and update our pseudocode to reflect that. Where do we end? To be sure it's sorted, we'll have to look at every item in the array. We'll see the first item when we start on the second and compare that with the first. But we'll have to move current all the way through the last item, including that item, to make sure we see them all. So end at the last item. Let's run through our basic algorithm to check if it'll work before turning it into code. Recall that insertion sort works by building a sorted array one step at a time as it moves forward. If current starts here, then everything before current, just one item in this case, is sorted. We'll insert into that sorted portion by swapping while current is greater than previous, making the sorted portion longer as we step forward. So it seems like if we move current through the end of the list, we'll end up with a sorted list. Actually, there's still a problem. Can you spot it? Let's code this up and we'll uncover what the problem is. I'll demonstrate with Python, but Java and C++ are in the description. This outer part becomes a loop, and we use an index i to get each item out of our array. Indexes start at zero, so index one is the second item. We'll call our array ARR. 
With indexes starting at zero, the last item is at an index of length ARR minus one. But in Python, ranges don't include the ending point, so just putting the length will work. Now this I keeps track of how many items we've processed as we move down the array. As we swap an item backward through the array, we need another index, J, to keep track of where we are for swapping. So the current item is ARR bracket J, and the item before that is ARRJ minus 1. J will start equal to the spot we're at in the outer loop. In other words, J equals I. And let's not forget to decrement J inside our while loop. Then there's the swap. Python lets us do swaps easily without a third variable like this. It seems like we're done, but this code will crash. Before you watch this next part, try and figure out why it crashes and which item will make it crash. So let's run this to see where it fails. That didn't take long. This item crashed it. Why? We keep decrementing j as long as the current item is smaller than what's before it. But the current item is the smallest so far, so the condition on the while loop never fails. We decrement j to zero and try to compare the item at index zero to the item at index j minus one, that is, at negative one. In many languages like Java, just trying to get an item outside of our array will cause a crash. Python will let us use negative one as an index, but this is still broken. You can run it for yourself to see what happens. The problem happened when j got to zero, so let's prevent it by checking that j is greater than zero. And let's check that this makes sense by rerunning the step that broke it. When j is 1, we'll compare this item, which again is the smallest we've seen, with the one before it. This item's smaller, so we swap it. Our item is at the start of the array, where it should be. We decrement j to 0, and the loop condition fails with the item in just the right spot. So our fix works. Let's restart this and watch the insertion sort we built in action. The algorithm's correct now. It'll sort the full array just fine without crashing. But there's another issue. Insertion sort is slow. And to understand how slow, we're going to pause right here. So the item we're about to move is the smallest in the whole array. It won't crash because of our check. But this item is all the way at the wrong end. Moving it to the right spot has the highest cost we can ever have for one step. What is that cost? In other words, in my while loop, how many comparisons will I make and how many swaps will I do? Take a guess. You ready? Let's check. It's going to be this many swaps and comparisons. And to remind you, we have this many items. With 100 items, what's the largest number of comparisons and swaps I might have to do? Okay, and let's think more like computer scientists. How many would it be for n items? That's right, it's n minus 1. Now I'll add three more items to the end of the array to more clearly illustrate the point. The last item still needs n minus 1 swaps and comparisons. The second to last needs n minus 2. The third to last n minus 3. You get the idea. So in the worst case, roughly how many total swaps and comparisons might I have to make to sort an array with n items? I'll skip the details because this isn't a math video. Here's your answer. Insertion sort needs swaps and comparisons proportional to n squared. That's the worst case for insertion sort, and it's also the average case. In technical terms, insertion sort has quadratic time complexity, O of n squared. In practical terms, that just means insertion sort is slow, very slow. To emphasize how slow, Let's consider the rough cost of sorting a million items. So n equals a million. n squared is going to be this much. Merge sort, a faster sort, has an average and worst case of n log n. For a million, n log n is this much. Yeah, it's not a small difference. As we get bigger, the gap gets wider. Insertion sort isn't just slow, it's paralyzingly slow. And we still use it all the time, like I said at the start of the video. How can that be? One, big O isn't everything. Two, big problems break into small problems. See, 
people think Big O is about runtime. It's really not. It's an abstraction that captures complexity. Like any abstraction, it hides details. To understand which details and why that matters, let's take a look at this graph of n log n and n squared. As we're looking at this, remember that we like lower numbers here for fewer steps. So Big O hides details like this, this, and this. We can plug in some values here to see how the two graphs change. Now the key thing is to note, no matter what exact values I plug in, n log n will always be lower than n squared beyond some point. This idea that f of x will eventually be greater than g of x, regardless of what these multipliers are, is at the heart of why big O hides those details. What this means is that, depending on these hidden factors, f of x can be lower for small n. Remember that f of x roughly reflects the number of steps we need to do insertion sort. And this isn't just theoretical. These hidden factors and various implementation details in the real world mean that insertion sort is faster than algorithms like merge sort or quick sort for small values of n. How small? The details differ, but it's often between 7 and 50. Okay then, so it might seem like the message here is to use insertion sort on smaller arrays and faster sorts like quick sort or merge sort on bigger arrays. But actually, we can do better than that. See, algorithms like quicksort and merge sort work by breaking a big problem into smaller problems. That's why they're called divide and conquer algorithms. Why not divide until we get problems so small that insertion sort works better, and then switch to that? It's a great idea that's inside the optimized sorts many standard libraries use. In other words, if you write code, when you call the library sort function, insertion sort is running as part of that. An insertion sort is probably in your day-to-day -day life as well. When you're looking for plane tickets, or checking which crypto grew fastest today, or anything else that sorts, all that data that's sorted is getting split into smaller subproblems, which are processed into even smaller problems, which likely get sorted using insertion sort. So whether you know it or not, you're using insertion sort all the time. It's a slow algorithm in many ways, but it's something we rely on every day. I'm CodeSlate, and I hope this video helped you understand how insertion sort works and why, despite being slow, it's worth knowing about. If you want to understand another sorting algorithm, click here. And thank you.